Well, this morning, it's my pleasure to introduce <clears throat> Sarah Posner, our speaker. Uh, Sarah is an American journalist and an author. She has written for many publications, including The Nation, Salon, The Atlantic, The Guardian, and The Washington Post. She was a contributing writer for Religion uh, Dispatches, writing in the intersection of religion and politics. Sarah is the author of two books. Her first, which has a delightful pun in the title, which I hope you get, it's called God's Prophets, with an F, Faith, Fraud, and the Republican Crusade for Values Voters. And her latest book is entitled <clears throat> Unholy, Why White Evangelicals Worship at the Altar of Donald Trump. This morning, she's going to be speaking to us on why white evangelicals still support Donald Trump. Thank you, Sarah. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Diana, and thanks to everyone for hosting me today. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, the, when I first discussed with Joe about um, appearing with you on this date, I asked him, are you sure you don't wanna have this before the election without really realizing how resonant it would still be after an election that Donald Trump lost? <laughs> So today I'm going to be discussing my book, Unholy, um, that Diana mentioned in her introductory remarks. Um, if it interests you and you wanna buy it, I wanna encourage you to buy it from your local independent bookstore. If that's not accessible to you, the website bookshop.org ships to you from local independent bookstores and helps keep them afloat during this pandemic when they're experiencing obviously a loss of foot traffic and um, sales. So um, I'm gonna talk about the book a little bit and then I'm going to add sort of a coda on it to discuss in more detail the role of conspiracy theories uh, in Trump's support from white evangelicals. Um, because I think that that's very critical right now to understand why Trump is still experiencing a large element of support um, in his unhinged efforts to um, overturn a democratic election. So um, a question that I get asked all the time because I cover uh, evangelicals and religion and politics is how people who purport to be Christians who, or who purport to be values voters, um, how can they support the three times married, pussy grabbing, lying President Donald Trump? And the story that I always have to tell them is that this is not really about Christianity as many people might think of it, um, with Christians who want to help the poor or um, fight climate change or um, end capital punishment. The evangelicals who support Donald Trump, and, and I often um, modify that with white evangelicals because the thrust of his support from evangelicals is from white evangelicals. Um, that support is um, driven not by those values of Christianity that some people may associate with Christianity, but rather with white Christian nationalism. And they see Trump as the savior for them um, from the changes that took place in the United States over the second half of the 20th century, which they view as a threat to their, what they might call their heritage or their way of life. Um, when Trump first ran for president in 2015, when he launched his campaign with the ride down the escalator and calling Mexicans uh, criminals and rapists, many people, including myself, um, thought that he would not be able to win over um, white evangelicals who are such a critical component 
um, of the Republican base, you know, 30 to 40 percent of the Republican base and uh, who have an outsized role in Republican primaries because they're very active and enthusiastic Republican primary voters. And it wasn't necessarily because of his broadsides against immigrants, which many white evangelicals do not view as something problematic, um, but more because he does not present as one of them, which historically, since um, evangelicals became involved in Republican electoral politics with the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980, um, they have demanded of, of, um, of, uh, of candidates that they be a Christian, that they have a salvation story, um, that they be able to articulate um, how they would govern from what they call a biblical worldview, and that they pass litmus tests on issues like abortion and LGBTQ rights. And Trump did none of those things. Um, you know, he inf infamously couldn't cite a single Bible verse that is his favorite. Um, he doesn't have a salvation story. He never goes to church. Um, he, you know, there's the famous 2 Corinthians um, citation. Yet white evangelicals in the primaries flocked to him, even though there were candidates like Ted Cruz or Marco Rubio who are very fluent in this Bible language that um, white evangelicals want to hear from candidates. And the reason why Trump was so appealing to them was that he, he articulated this broadside against liberalism, against liberal democracy, against civil rights, against equal rights, that spoke to them as that he was someone who would not pussyfoot around or worry about his legacy or bipartisanship. They liked that he um, wanted to institute a Muslim ban, for example, in a, in a very strong man kind of um, method that he was just gonna impose these sorts of things and that he didn't really care about bipartisanship or civility. He was, he became seen as their savior. And so even though white evangelical leadership did not, was hesitant about him at first, really wanted somebody like Ted Cruz who really spoke the language, um, the base was really for Trump. And eventually the leadership had to come around and, um, eventually the leadership came to see Trump as someone who was anointed by God to save America at this critical juncture in its history. And to understand how this came about and how somebody who so unabashedly articulated um, this basically a broadside against liberal democracy. And when I say that, I'm talking about not just the institutions of a liberal democracy, a free press. So he attacked a free press um, by calling it fake news or the enemy of the people. He attacked an independent judiciary by suggesting that judges who ruled against him were um, essentially not real Americans or by attacking any judge that would rule against him on any basis and by using his presidency to attempt to stack the judiciary with um, ideological and um, political allies. And he also attacked um, the idea of basically a three, branch, three branches of government, not just the independent judiciary, but a legislative branch that would <clears throat> uh, exercise oversight over a runaway executive. And he also um, attacked just the values of a liberal democracy, the idea that everybody should be treated equally under the law, that everybody should be treated with equal dignity and respect um, in civil life, not just under the law. He assaulted all of those things. 
And that was what white evangelicals saw as his way of saving them. Uh, and a lot of people look at this relationship and think of it as transactional, that the white evangelicals, they were skeptical at first, but then he promised them judges that would overturn Roe versus Wade, or he promised to um, continue to prosecute a war on Christmas, or he promised that he would quote unquote protect their religious freedom. And while it's true that those uh, things that that sort of transactional will come out and vote for you if you do those things for us as president were a factor in the support of uh, the white evangelical leadership. It was really, um, it's really more um, emotional. There's sort of more of an emotional or gut reaction that he is, like I said, this anointed one, this savior figure, this strong man that they've always been waiting for. So to understand the history here, I think it's important to understand two, two, two lines, historical lines of how white evangelicals became involved in electoral politics. One is how in the 1970s, there was a movement called, um, it was called at the time, the New Right. And the new right was an attempt to create more of a right-wing populist version of the Republican party that would veer away from um, say country club Republicanism and appeal more to that sort of mythical middle, middle American Christian white guy. And one of the leaders of this movement was a man named Paul Weyrich who was a very conservative uh, Catholic and was working very hard to also bring white evangelicals into this new political movement. And Rick um, had a lot of trouble bringing them in. He was, because he was a very conservative Catholic, he had long been opposed to abortion and was involved in uh, Catholic anti-abortion politics, but he could not engage um, white evangelicals on that issue. They just simply, it was just not a resonant issue for them. But he did find that a resonant issue for them was school desegregation. And specifically um, in the 1970s, um, the Internal Revenue Service was using its authority to ensure that people weren't creating private schools in order to avoid school desegregation. So in 1954, you had um, Brown versus Board of Education. In the 1960s, schools started desegregating, public schools started desegregating, and you saw the rise of uh, schools, K through 12 schools that were called segregation academies. These were schools in the deep South where they were explicitly founded to avoid school desegregation. And many of them saw their tax exemption taken away because the IRS's position was, look, you cannot um, avoid, you cannot get a tax exemption by creating an institution that's intended to avoid this very important public policy objective of the United States government that the courts have said is a constitutional issue, which is school desegregation. But what you saw at the same time was because in the early 1960s, so this goes to how there were all of these cultural and political and um, legal changes that were happening in the United States. So you had Brown in 1954, and then in the early 1960s, you had the Supreme Court, um, you had the Supreme Court um, invalidating mandatory school prayer and mandatory school Bible reading. So all of these things converge to um, propel this Christian school movement. And many of these Christian schools, while not with the intent, um, the intentional uh, segregation uh, uh, origin that many of the segregation academies had, were nonetheless essentially segregated. So the IRS said to them, look, we're not gonna shut you down like we shut down the segregation academies, but look, you've got to prove to us that you're at least making an effort to not be all white. Um, and there was an enormous backlash against that, enormous. And it was uh, portrayed as 
the federal government infringing on our freedom and in particular our religious freedom because these are Christian schools and we should be free to operate without um, interference from the government. And the government said, fine, but you can't get a tax exemption for that. At the same time, the IRS had also taken away the tax exemption of Bob Jones University, which was a college, still is a college in South Carolina, which had a, um, which had a policy against interracial dating. It lost its tax exemption over that. And so this battle went on for years and years and years. And it still, it, it basically brought white evangelicals into the political fold, animated them to get involved in the moral majority and other religious right groups that were founded in the late 1970s and early 1980s and to support the, um, uh, to support the, uh, uh, election of Ronald Reagan. And since then, they've been very actively and crucially involved in uh, Republican Party politics. Um, so when you hear that abortion is the main animating issue for the religious right today, it is true that abortion is, is a chief animating issue for them. But given this origin story, given what initially animated them into politics, you can see how First, issues around race and what they would call religious freedom were chief animating issues at the time. And that this formed the underlying uh, ideology that still exists today. And that is that the federal government is um, staffed with overreaching bureaucrats who are against our religion and our religious freedom and we must either work to undermine the government, but also work to have our own ideologues staff the government. And so Trump became kind of a perfect vessel for this because he allowed them to do that, but he also signaled through word and deed that he was very open to doing this in very anti-democratic ways. Now, the other thing that happened when Trump was running for president alongside white evangelicals supporting him was that he was uh, electrifying what is known as the alt-right, which is the far, far right of the American conservative movement, which under Trump has become more of the mainstream of the conservative movement, which is like white supremacists and neo-Nazis, the people you saw marching in Charlottesville, the people who descended on Washington DC last weekend, the Proud Boys that Trump has um, winked and nodded with and incited. Um, and they were simultaneously um, uh, cheering on Trump for many of the same reasons that white evangelicals were, that he was defending, that he was sort of the savior figure who was defending them from the terrors of political correctness and liberal democracy. And again, you see the roots, and I go into a lot of detail in, in this in the book, you see the roots of this movement as well in the early days of the new right. Many of the early um, players in the new right are now sort of considered the intellectual godfathers of the alt-right and were very, very open um, with their racism and white nationalism even. Um, their opposition to immigration, uh, their opposition to civil rights laws, and their promotion of this sort of idealized middle American uh, white Christian guy. Um, and so this is how we ended up with Trump and Trump comes along in a moment when globally uh, right-wing populist authoritarians are gaining more power and gaining more popularity. So could Trump have done this? Was Trump just, uh, could he have done this alone? could um is he sort of a an aberration on the global stage and i would argue that he is not that this is a global uh movement this is a global change that's taking place we see it in world leaders like jair bolsonaro in in brazil victor orban in hungary poland's law and justice party vladimir putin um, so this is not going to go away uh, once Trump leaves office. And obviously, once Trump leaves office, he's not leaving the public stage. Mm -hmm. And so um, 
you know, he intends to continue to stoke this movement, not just in the United States, but around the world. Um, I would add that even before Trump became president, that Trump was not the instigator of uh, American conservatives looking abroad to these leaders as prototypes or um, inspiration for the kind of leadership they, they would want in the United States. Um, that kind of looking abroad to that um, uh, and viewing pro-democracy and pro-civil society efforts of our own government, of our own State Department um, as uh, leftist shenanigans that needed to be shut down. And um, when you see um, a lot of anti-George Soros conspiracy theories, that's because Soros's open society um, organization funds a lot of these democracy uh, uh, building, civil society building programs around the world and is funded by um, the State Department uh, to promote democracy and civil society and fledgling democracies. And even before Trump, major figures in the conservative movement and the Republican Party portrayed these kinds of efforts as sort of you know, seditious, anti-American, anti-Christian, uh, leftist horror shows. Um, so I think it's important to understand that while Trump remains this sort of singular mythic figure to much of the base, he's not an aberration. And while eventually they will have to like let go of the fact that he, the idea that they see him as this singular figure, um, he's not, it, the, what he stoked or what he incited or what he instigated will not go away when he goes away, whether he leaves the White House or leaves public life, which he clearly has no intention of doing. <clears throat> the other um, facet, the historical facet that I think is important to understand and relates to the subject of my previous book, which Diana talked about, God's Prophets, P-R-O-F-I-T-S. Uh, which was a book about televangelism and how televangelists became enmeshed in Republican Party politics. And Trump, while Trump is all a product of these growing right-wing anti-democratic, anti-liberal movements that have been percolating in the United States and around the world for many decades, um, he's also very much a product of American televangelism which teaches a theology known as the prosperity gospel, which claims that you can name it and claim it. Like if you want to be rich, you know, you can speak something into existence or you can speak your health into existence if you've been sick, say with COVID. Um, and if you watch uh, televangelism and, you know, I, would, I wouldn't recommend it, but I would suggest that perhaps it's valuable to understand Trump and to understand the present Republican Party. So if you have it in your cable package or you can find it on YouTube, I, I think it would be worth watching a few clips of it because it's very instructive, not only for the way Trump behaves, but for why um, the evangelical base continues to revere him. And that is that it's very much centered on the idea that a grift is okay <laughs> because televangelists make their money by bilking their followers into believing that if you give me money, then you will get a supernatural return on your investment. So if you give me, um, you know, twenty dollars, you will get a supernatural return, a thousandfold return. Of course, this isn't true. This is just made up. But this is how the televangelists get people to give them money, and then the televangelists have these huge mansions and private jets. And then that is seen as evidence that they have God's blessing on them because if you are rich and have all of these things, that must mean that you have enough faith that God has blessed you. So it's not seen as a grift or a con. Um, it's seen as proof that you are worthy and that God sees you as being worthy. So I think a lot of people from the outside look at, for example, Trump's effort to raise money purportedly for his reelection legal challenges that he's, um, that he's pushing right now. But 
there's been a lot of reporting that the small print on those um, donation solicitations show that it's actually going to another purpose to a super PAC that's going to fund, you know, his his political comeback. Um, and a lot of people are aghast, and they should be. Uh, but for Trump followers who are students of or steeped in televangelism, the idea that your anointed one is asking you for money and then maybe not using it for the thing that they say they're going to use it for is just sort of normal course of events. Um, so that kind of showmanship that he exhibits at his rallies, where he intersperses his own grandiosity with claims of being persecuted by people who are against him or against Christianity or against what it really means to be an American or against white people. Um, that is very much out of the same sort of cloth as um, the way televangelists speak to their audiences. And we know that Trump ha has very close relationships with a lot of televangelists, particularly Paula White, um, who is his uh, longtime friend and pastor, spiritual advisor, and White House advisor. So um, my book came out in late May. <laughs> so it it came out the same day um, that the George Floyd protests started. And um, obviously I finished writing it and it was all complete and sent to the printer and everything before that, before COVID. <laughs> um, and so now I'm gonna talk a little bit about a coda on the book, which relates to um, conspiracy theories and the role that they continue to play in Trump's support and support, including from um, evangelicals. And obviously QAnon is the most visible conspiracy theory. I, I assume everyone's sort of heard of it, um, uh, knows a little bit about it. Um, and in a nutshell, um, it claims that a deep state of a cabal of left-wing satanic pedophiles is secretly plotting a coup against President Trump. Um, and that ultimately he will emerge victoriously um, uh, and prevail over this, over this deep state plot. And um, you see, if maybe not specifically QAnon itself, but just the idea of a deep state plot against the president, maybe not a coup against him, but maybe now morphing a little bit into a, a, a plot to steal the election or to rig the election or, um, to rig voting machines or to steal ballots or to throw away ballots. These are all the elements of Trump's bogus legal challenges to the outcome of the election, but they're all of a kind with the QAnon conspiracy theory, which claims that there's this deep state, you know, the democracy <laughs> the, uh, or the bureaucracy of the democracy um, that is against Trump. It's satanic, they're pedophiles, they're criminals, and they're out to get him. And so when you've immersed people in that kind of conspiracy theory, which um, Trump's base has been immersed in through the entirety of his presidency, it's not hard to see why he has a base of supporters who are willing to believe the craziest Rudy Giuliani hair dye dripping conspiracy theories um, about the election. But I wanted to, because my talk today is about white evangelicals. I wanted to talk a little bit more specifically about how these kinds of conspiracy theories very intentionally, I think, um, hone in on conspiracy theories or the kinds of conspiratorial thinking that has permeated white evangelical culture for many decades. When Q started making news in 2019 and 2020, I kind of wondered, like, part of me was like, wait, this doesn't sound very new. Like, everybody was talking about, oh, QAnon, it's this new conspiracy theory. And, like, let's try to understand what the, all the elements of the QAnon conspiracy theory are. Um, but I felt like every component of it was very kind of familiar to me from my reporting on the alt-right and my also my reporting on the Christian right. Um, and I... I also feel like from my reporting, I always had the sense that there were conspiracy theories that uh, started in the alt-right and kind of, you know, jumped like a cross-pollination into the Christian right and vice versa. So they share a lot of the same conspiracy theories. Um, 
So, you know, you'll see some of the same conspiracy theories on white nationalist sites as you will on Christian right sites. And recently, I returned to an interview I did in 2016 with a white supremacist um, who considers himself to be an all right Christian. Um, and this was right after Trump got elected. And he thought that the Trump presidency would be good for all like all right Christians like him, um, who he said, um, and he and he thought that, that would in, it would increase the bond between white Christian Americans and white Christian Russians who are being kept from being friends by the Jewish cabal holding the reins of the American political establishment. And he added, Trump in charge of the federal government will ensure that criminals like Hillary Clinton get locked up and thugs like the Black Lives Matter movement get suppressed. And he kept a group of pedophile Satanists intent on auditioning off the services of the federal government to the highest foreign bidder out of the White House. So that's always a good thing too. So obviously these are all elements of QAnon, which you know QAnon supposedly started in 2017. These, these sorts of ideas were already permeating uh, Trump space well before that. Um, and in terms of white evangelicals, I think that well before Trump came along, they were very um, amenable to or susceptible to conspiracies that were nonetheless filled with speculation and inconsistencies. It's kind of a form of entertainment, almost like a sugar rush, rush which you often see in televangelism. You'll see a televangelist uh, talk about the end times, the rapture, the second return of Jesus. And a lot of it, it's, there's a lot of drama and suspense and prophecy. And even if that prophecy turns out to be wrong, you can come back from more speculation and suspense and a different prophecy. Um, so that's why when a lot of the QAnon prophecies didn't come to pass, QAnon proponents would tell their followers, you do the research, you, you dig into all of these internet rabbit holes and maybe you'll come up with something else. Um, in the end times conspiracy, for example, um, there is uh, an antichrist one world government that will come to pass and force people to have the mark of the beast, things like barcodes in grocery stores or social security numbers or even vaccines have been things that have been seen as possibly the mark of the beast and a sign of the end times. And during this time, the Antichrist will attempt to rule via a one world government and force people to adopt the mark of the beast and relinquish their Christianity, supposedly. Um, and many, many events throughout history have been seen as the one world government or a precursor to it, including the United Nations, the European Union. And it was thought that uh, Donald, uh, Barack Obama might be the Antichrist. So, um, a lot of evangelicals and particularly charismatic and Pentecostal evangelicals um, see themselves as in a sort of perpetual spiritual war with these forces that are satanic, anti-Christian, anti-American. And so they're sort of perpetually engaged in this idea that they must be um, constantly engaging in spiritual warfare, that they shouldn't give up, that they shouldn't um, stop, um, that they shouldn't let satanic forces prevail over godly forces um, in politics, in culture, in the broader society. So you can see why, given this propensity to conspiracy theories, this idea that they see Donald Trump as an anointed figure, a figure that, you know, sometimes God chooses an unlikely figure. So Donald Trump may not be a Christian, but God has chosen him to lead America in this moment in history when it's under siege by this deep state cabal or by Hillary Clinton or by whatever the conspiracy of the day is. And so it sort of keeps them perpetually engaged in this sort of ever escalating war against our democracy. So um, I will, end it there. I'm assuming that people <laughs> will have questions and there's a lot more to talk about, um, but um, I wanted to kind of 
put an end to me talking at you and hopefully engage in a, in a discussion here um, to the extent we can with the Zoom um, technology. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, it has given me quite a lot of insights into the events of the last four years, tumultuous events of the last four years. And uh, it's been wonderful to hear you um, explicating that what is seeming, seeming unexplainable uh, to, to most people, completely unexplainable. Um, and it's very gracious of you to invite questions because you may know our group is always full of questions. Um, if you have a question for our speaker, Sarah, um, please remember that it should be a question and not a statement. Please try to make your question less than one minute. We have lots of people who want to be involved. We'd like to hear two from new voices, people who have not asked questions before. And if you want to put a question in the chat window, you may, but sometimes it's hard to see those questions. So don't be too disappointed if we miss your question, but we would like to try to include as many pos people as possible. So now I'm going to call on David again to work your Zoom master magic and manage the Q&A. Thanks, okay. David. Thank, thank you, Diana. Uh, we have a number of hands up, but I'm going to ask the first question. One theory I've heard about why Trump has retained his support among evangelical women in particular, given his libertine ways, is that the <clears throat> evangelical world is full of pastors, ministers, televangelists who've been caught with their pants down and that and get get forgiven and that Trump is just another one of those. I, I wonder if you could comment on that. I think that's an element of it. Um, I think that some people um, either like, let me just backtrack. I There's an interview I did many, many, many years ago for my other book of a woman, uh, of several women who had belonged to a church with this precise problem, the pastor, um, was sleeping with many women in the congregation, um, claiming that it was something that God had told him to do. And um, I interviewed women who hadn't been one of those women, but were in the congregation. And they talked about how they just refused to believe it, right? Even, you know, so because they had been told not to believe the local newspaper, this was in Atlanta, so, you know, not to believe the Atlanta Journal Constitution. Um, they just, you know, if it was in the paper, they just didn't read it or they didn't believe that it was true. So there's sort of an element of that didn't happen. That's something that's made up by his enemies or it's a satanic plot to smear him. Um, I think that there's also the element of that was in his past. Now he's a different man. Look at his relationship with Melania or look at how much he loves his children. I've had many evangelicals tell me to look at how much he loves his children which like is amazing to me because it doesn't seem to be to me that he loves his children. But anyway, um, and, um, and so, yes, I think many evangelical women are conditioned to not question male authority for one thing. Um, and then there's the element, particularly um, in um, sort of televangelism kinds of churches, that you do not question the authority of the leader. And so because Trump has been presented to them as God's anointed one, they believe that, that any, anyone who's God's anointed should not, be, um, should not be questioned. So that combination of submitting to male authority, um, to not question the authority of um, God's anointed, um, plus the disbelief of the news media, I think those things uh, converge uh, to uh, to blind people to that past. I do think that there are a lot of evangelical women who can't stand Trump because, precisely because he reminds them of the shady pastor. Um, but obviously, you know, there's not enough of them to break that um, very significant hold that Trump has on white evangelicals. Okay, thank you. Uh, Allison or Len Goldstein, you are next. Please unmute yourself. So 
Thank you, Sarah, for that great talk. Um, the question I have for you concerns young evangelicals. Um, prior to the election, I was watching um, a program and they were interviewing voters. And this young evangelical male um, said, well, now that Amy Coney Barrett has been installed into the Supreme Court, I'm gonna now vote for Biden. And, you know, I was like, wow, what, where, you know, where did that come from? Is that just maybe a young evangelical opinion or what do you think? I don't know. I mean, I think that's one evangelical's opinion, right? As opposed to the young evangelical opinion. Um, I think, I, you know, every, every election cycle, you'll see news stories about young evangelicals, how they're breaking away from their, um, uh, their fathers and mothers and they're more liberal and you know they have more issues than just abortion and uh, same-sex marriage and that they care about the environment and whatever and i think that we haven't seen a lot of evidence that this is a movement yet yeah, yes these evangelicals exist right and there's no denying that but we haven't seen very much evidence if any, any evidence at all that they're a movement that can break that bond of white evangelicals and the Republican Party that gives the Republican Party the ability to say to continue to support Trump in, in the face of all of his corruption and wrongdoing and attacks on our democracy. They do it because they know the basis behind them, right? So even if you have, you know, some younger evangelicals or some breakaway evangelicals, it hasn't been enough to break that. And I think the part of the um, misconception in looking at the decline of evangelicalism among white people, um, among younger people, sorry, among younger people, um, I think overlooks the anti-majoritarian structure of our country, of our, of our politics. So you can't just look at those numbers, you have to look at how uh, white evangelicals have intertwined themselves with the Republican Party politics and how that helps support the Republican Party's anti-majoritarian hold on our institutions, like the Senate and the Electoral College. Um, because the numbers aren't everything and demography isn't destiny. And um, yeah, so those, those evangelicals exist, but like, I think they're a little bit outliers. Also, like how you could support Amy Coney Barrett and support Joe Biden seems like, what? Right. <laughs> Unless you think that everything needs to be balanced out. Now the Supreme Court is ultra right wing. And so I'll balance it out with a democratic president, but that makes no sense. Thank you. Um, Allison would like to ask a question, please. Um, I was interested in your impression of uh, how evangelicals justified or reacted to the fall from grace of Jerry Falwell Jr. I think the reaction has been, we're not gonna talk about it. Oh, sure. Yeah, um, <laughs> I think it also happened at a time when there was so much other stuff going on, right? Like if it had happened at a time when, you know, we weren't having an election and things weren't so crazy, I think, it would have um, forced them to say something publicly because journalists mm -hmm. would have been hounding them to say something and make a statement on it. I think the other thing to, that's important to understand about evangelical culture is that very rarely does somebody who's in a position of leadership get held to account for their conduct like that um, because very often um, they they go back to that spiritual warfare, right? That, you know, oh, you know, the, the classic, the devil made me do it kind of, kind of uh, excuse. Um, so I think a combination of things have, have made it sort of vanish off the public radar. Um, I think also, <clears throat> despite the fact that the rest of the world saw Jerry Falwell Jr.'s um, endorsement of Trump back in 2016 as a very pivotal thing. Um, he doesn't really have, he doesn't have the standing among evangelicals that his father did in terms of being like a thought leader. Uh, he inherited the university from his father. He's not a preacher or a pastor. Um, and I think 
it matters because a lot of evangelicals send their kids to liberty. I don't think it matters in terms of um, him being like a thought leader or a spiritual leader or a moral leader even um, for evangelicals. And I think that if he either, um, if he either steps down permanently or has some sort of um, come to Jesus literally moment um, where he repents, uh, I think that, um, you know, Liberty will probably just, you know, continue on with a, a different leadership. Okay, thank you. Uh, by the way, I put the direct link to Sarah's book uh, at bookshop.org. I'm putting that in the chat window right now. Okay, Janet Glass, you're next. Please unmute yourself and go ahead. Hi, uh, thank you. So, um, Sarah, you, you were saying that when Trump leaves office, he will continue to stoke the movement both in the United States and around the world. And I was intrigued by that around the world part. Um, and, and what other country do you see him as a major, him himself, not the evangelical movement in general, uh, Trump as a uh, substantial influencer? It's less that he's, he's obviously a substantial influencer here, right? Um, but the evangelical movement is worldwide, right? And I don't know that necessarily he would continue to be like an influencer for someone like Viktor Orban. I think that more that Viktor Orban was an influencer for Trump. <laughs> um, but I think Trumpism will continue to have a lot of sway and influence because it's very tied together with um, Orban's Hungary or um, the law and justice movement in Poland, the idea that white European Christians are under siege by political correctness, migration, Islam, um, George Soros, uh, is something that ties them, ties this sort of global movement together. Um, and Trump is a major figure in it. And even after he leaves office, all of that, um, all of that will still be there, even if he's not seen as, as even if people who aren't American don't see him as sort of the leader of it, he has left his mark on it. I think just by having gotten elected in the United States, which used to be the beacon of democracy, right? And that he basically um, endeavored and made many steps towards progressing to demolishing our democracy. I mean, these movements are at their core, anti-democratic small d. So to the extent that he had successes in undermining the greatest democracy in the world, I think he would still be considered um, like an important figure in that global movement. Hey, thank you. Ed Gross, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Thanks, David, and thanks, Sarah. Um, so uh, now I understand a lot better, I think, about how uh, he's perceived by um, um, white evangelicals. There's one area, though, where I would have thought, or maybe you haven't, maybe I didn't catch it, where, where I would have thought that white evangelicals would be different than the alt-right, and that is the outright cruelty, the kids uh, in cages and being separated from parents, the, uh, the support for police violence, that kind of thing. It seems so anti-Christian. What possible explanation could they have for uh, not being bothered by that. I think it's important first to understand that um, white evangelicals, just you know, based on uh, polling data, white evangelicals are um, immigration restriction. Were immigration restrictionists before Trump? So you know, it wasn't like they were coming at it like, oh, we support immigration, and then Trump came along and they changed their minds. They they were. Um, you know, being opposed to immigration was one of their things. It got a lot less attention because they don't, they didn't really 
make national political campaigns on it, you know, because they focused so much on religious freedom or what they call religious freedom, um, religious freedom or uh, uh, attacking church state separation or abortion or same sex marriage. But um, polling data is very clear that they were uh, immigration restrictionists. And then as far as uh, police um, brutality, they're also very much sort of Trump's law and order base. Um, and I know that like that, that's another one of those seeming incongruities because you might think of Christians as, you know, people who want to help the downtrodden. Um, but white evangelicals are Christian nationalists, right? So they see um, an America that God uh, ordained uh, to have law and order and not people crossing, you know, people crossing the border illegally and we need to have, you know, quell the unrest in our cities and so forth. So they weren't bothered by Trump clearing Lafayette Square with tear gas so he could go stand in front of St. John's Church. Um, similarly, they were not bothered by the kids in cages. And I will say that Trump's, um, the, the evangelical leaders who are Trump's like close allies, um, people like Paula White and Robert Jeffress who lead the uh, mega church in Dallas, um, that they were, um, you know, the biggest sort of excuse makers for all of that. Like Paula White went on this like huge tour of uh, immigration facilities and then she'd go on TV and saying that, that she went there and the kids are being treated really well. And, um, I interviewed Jeffress about the kids in, in cages. It's and I, I talk about it in the book, and like he just would not acknowledge that there was anything wrong. Like he's like, well, you know, like yeah, like I mean, I agree. Like all the kids should have soap and toothpaste and clothes and food, but you know, their parents are criminals. So, what else do you expect him to do? Thank you, um, Vito Havria. Please unmute yourself and go ahead. Vito, yeah, good, there you go. There you go. Hi, um, so my question is on the trends of the one world government conspiracy. Um, seems it's always been around, even the 90s when the United States was the lone superpower and now that China is emerging as a rival power, is this just a you know, continuing reaction to the less hegemonic role of the United States? No, because I don't think, well, yeah, I mean, I, I guess these people would never see the United States as not having a leadership world role, but if it, if they do see it as being under threat by China or Russia or whoever, um, they would, you know, in, in terms of their end times scenario, they would just sort of weave that in. The end times, the end times conspiracy theory is very malleable for whatever is going on in the world, right? So you have these sort of self-anointed prophets and apostles on TV doing all of their prophecies. So like, oh, China did this. And so maybe this is a sign of something or, you know, Russia did that, or there was, you know, it, there's, that's the enduring nature of them. And like people make a lot of money on the enduring nature of them, you know, movies and TV and books, you know, you remember the left behind book series and movies like made, you know, sold tens of millions of copies of books. So the purveyors of this know that it's just really a form of entertainment or, um, maybe not entertainment necessarily, but just sort of keeping people, you know, on the edge of their seats, a form of, you know, perpetual suspense. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend a lot of time trying to like make sense of it or like try to put a, a round peg in a square hole or whatever it is, because none of it makes any sense. It's just sort of designed to be self-perpetuating and never go away. Okay, thank you. Uh iPhone 7P, who I think is Carol Evans, but I'm not certain. You, would you unmute yourself and go ahead with your question? And we'll find out who you are. <laughs> it's, hi, can you hear me? Yes, hi, that is Carol, okay. Hi, it's me, I'm so, yeah, I, I'm, I should put my name in. Um, uh, hi, uh, I um, thank you for this wonderful, uh, discussion, this wonderful insight that you've given us. Um, I have talked with many um, 
uh, evangelical followers um, and try to have discussions with them. And um, at, at first, my my inclination was that anybody who could think that way is just mentally disturbed and should be in institutionalized. But as as time goes on, I mean, these are otherwise functional, logical people that believe in that. And I just realized how uh, there it just seems so um, uh it makes me very pessimistic because I, I don't know how, what we can do, if anyone has any suggestions or if you have any suggestions, um, what we can do to deal with people who are just so fearful and are waiting for the Antichrist, who have actually think that my, you know, my opposing them is the possibility that I could be the Antichrist, you know, I mean, it's just so illogical. I don't know how to make any headway. Do you have any, any suggestions on that? I get asked this all the time and I have no idea <laughs> <laughs> um, because, you know, I've, uh, I've interviewed a lot of people who would never change their minds. And then I've interviewed a lot of people who um, uh, have left evangelicalism. They, they call themselves ex-evangelicals, some of them. Uh, and, you know, and they described to me uh, the, you know, what, what led them to leave, right? Whether it was like feeling spiritually abused or just concluding that this shit's crazy or whatever. Um, but I feel like, you know, yes, there's a lot of those people. Like if you Google the term ex-evangelical, you'll find a ton of websites and Facebook groups and whatever, right? So those people exist, but I think people are, there's also people who are sort of perpetually <laughs> drawn to this or newly drawn to it. Um, people don't, you know, people can be illogical. People can look for um, ecstasy and um, belonging in many different ways. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm a political reporter. I'm not an expert in psychology or any of that. So like, I don't, you know, I, don't, I really don't know how to answer your question. I'm really sorry. It's okay. Anyway, uh, it's baffling. Okay. okay. Uh, thank you, Carol. Joe Schumann, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you so very much, Sarah. Let me just say, I'd like to encourage all our members and friends to access your book. It's absolutely marvelous and very readable and obviously very important. Uh, I just want to make one observation, and then I do have a question. Um, you started off by talking about the contradiction between Christian values on the one hand and the values of uh, contemporary evangelicals on the other. And I think one way maybe to understand this is to say that Christianity isn't just one thing. Uh, you have the Christianity of Jesus, and of course, if you look at the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, in, in effect, is an advocate for the poor, for the marginalized. He hangs out with and has respect for women and so on and so forth. And yet you have Christian evangelicals. I'd like to suggest that an alternative Christianity goes back to the fourth century, and that is Constantinian Christianity where Constantine, in effect, conquers, he sees a sign, right? He says, in hoc signo vincus, in this sign you will conquer. It's the sign of the cross, but the, sign, the cross is also the sword. And in effect, he has a military victory and makes Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. So there you have the identification of Christianity with the military and political power of the state going back to the fourth century. And I would argue that that has always surfaced within the context of Christianity, either in Catholic or Protestant variations. And what you see now is a play out of that Constantinian sort of uh, Christianity 1600 centuries later. It's, it's long instantiated as an alternative form of Christianity. But the question I wanna ask, which I come back to over and over again, is how evangelicals have made abortion the centerpiece of their political program when the Hebrew Bible and the Christian Bible is totally silent on abortion. They will sometimes say, yeah, there's a Hebrew Psalm that says, I knew you even when you were in the womb, but that doesn't say anything about abortion. Uh, it's totally, totally silent in that regard. And I once, I once asked Randall Barmer, who was, you consulted with and was a colleague of mine at Barnard, about this, and he speculated maybe evangelicals feel themselves 
under the thumb of East Coast elites, which of course is an argument given today, and feel the politics of humiliation. And that causes them to identify with the helplessness of the fetus that has elevated in effect abortion to the, to the jewel in the crown of their politics. But I'm not convinced, and I'm wondering what your insight is into that, because that truly is a mystery because of the silence, total silence of the Hebrew and Christian uh, uh, Bibles on the issue of abortion. That's it. That's my question. Okay. <laughs> so, um, well, I would argue that um, American evangelicalism in its present form is a very American creation. Um, and that part of that creation, because, um, you know, you, while American evangelicals have succeeded in uh, bringing evangelicals around the world into their sort of Christian nationalist ideology, um, left to their own devices, like evangelicals in Canada, <laughs> they're not, evangelicals in Canada are not obsessed with abortion. <clears throat> So I think that the abortion question was really more of, um, or their engagement with the abortion question was a political strategy. And then it became what I would call a bludgeon strategy where um, they were, they use it to portray themselves as caring about the, um, the innocent and helpless the fetus, right? Who is more innocent and helpless than a fetus, right? That's, that's the way they approach it. And so if you were to say to them, what about the kids in cages? They were like, but, but we care about the fetus. That's like the more innocent and helpless one. Um, so I do think that it's, it's a very American thing and it has a lot to do with the coalition that I talked about in my remarks where there was this right-wing Catholic um, movement part of the new right. And they really needed just for the numbers and just for like creating this new um, base for the Republican party, they needed white evangelicals in there. They brought them in on the school desegregation stuff, but over time they made them care very much about the abortion issue. A lot of that had to do with Francis Schaeffer and his campaign um, through his movie um, and, and going around to, uh, you know, different uh, evangelical gatherings to convince evangelicals who hadn't previously believed this, that abortion was murder. Um, so I think that it had, um, it just had to do with coalition building and then it became an article of faith. And it's been useful to them uh, because it's their pushback against, well, why don't you care about the poor and the helpless? Well, we do. I think the other very important thing to understand is when they are faced with the um, argument that, you know, you don't care about the poor and the helpless, they say, well, we do, but we just think that the government should not be involved in that at all. So that's part of their very, so that at its core, they're very anti-government. They don't think that, you know, they don't think that the government should provide any um, social safety net, that it should just be done through churches. And so this is like just part of this sort of theocratic ideology that the government as a secular government is bad and it should do basically nothing. And that, you know, churches and families should do the rest. Um, I was gonna say one more thing on the abortion question, but it flew out of my head. Maybe it'll come to me later. Does that answer your question, Joe? I think so. We'll go on to the next question. Gail Levinson, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Thank you. Um, hello, everybody. Sarah, this has been one important uh, presentation and conversation we've been having. Um, so I'm glad that I'm participating in it as a viewer. Uh, this is my question. I'm, I'm just shocked by the sheer number of um, people who have become rabid supporters of Trump and this thinking. While I understand it and you've explained it so very well, I just keep seeing these numbers escalate by the day. I mean, we started with 30 million, 40 million, now 71, two, three million people have voted uh, to support Trump. Um, why are those with democratic values like all of us losing? It seems to me this 
this debate and this war, this division we're having in a country that was founded on these values. Well, numerically speaking, we're not losing, right? I mean, Joe Biden got more votes than any presidential candidate in history. Something now, what is it up to now? Six, eight million more than Trump? I can't remember what the number is. It's at least six. So um, I think you feel like you're losing because, um, because our demo the structure of our democracy is anti-majoritarian because of the electoral college and the structure of the Senate. Um, and you combine that with, you know, the, the just tons of uh, right wing money in politics, um, helping to fuel all of this. And so in terms of the values that people hold, people with democratic values aren't losing numerically, but they are losing in this anti majoritarian structure of ours. Now, having said that, I still find it like eye popping that more than 70 million people voted for Trump. I did not think that he was gonna find substantially more new voters um, in 2020, but I think it shows us that there is an appetite in our country for authoritarianism. I mean, I think there's no other explanation for that. And so I think that once Joe Biden takes office, which he will, even though everybody, you know, like it seems very tenuous and scary right now, that um, the Democratic Party and people on the left and people who consider themselves liberals and, and small D Democrats cannot just, you know, raise their arms in the air and say, yay, now our guys in the White House, you know, we're done. I mean, this is, a, this is going to be an intergenerational fight to preserve America as a democracy. And I'm not trying to sound alarmist. I literally mean that. Thank you. Ron Schwartz, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Thanks, David. Thanks, Sarah, for a really great platform. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, where do you think white evangelicals will go after January 20th when Trump loses his political power and his ability to appoint judges, et cetera, et cetera, uh, given the argument that uh, they believe that uh, he was elected because he's God, God's anointed messenger. Now that he has lost by more than 6 million votes, is he no longer God's anointed messenger? And will they go someplace else? My second question is, do you see the white evangelical movement as one that is growing? Or given uh, that so many studies show that people are becoming more secular and away from organized religious, is this a declining movement going into the future? Thanks. Okay. So... I think something that's really important to understand right now is that in right-wing media generally, and more specifically in evangelical media, Trump has not lost the election. It was stolen from him by Joe Biden and a horde of other conspiracy theories. Um, so what when you see Giuliani or Sidney Powell or Jenna Ellis on TV concocting these insane conspiracy theories about Hugo Chavez, who's been dead since 2013, and Dominion voting systems, like you've all seen it in the news. Uh, and you look at it and you're like, this is crazy talk. Well, for Trump's base, this is, you know, this is the new, this is the new conspiracy theory that's going to keep them agitated um, until 2024. And so, yeah, like Trump is still God's anointed, but what explains how Trump, how uh, God's anointed would be taken out of office? The deep state, the satanic uh, pedophile cabal that runs the deep state, other satanic forces, left-wing radicals, George Soros funded left-wing radicals. I mean, I know this all sounds nutty to you, but this is what, this is what it's all like on right-wing media right now. And I apologize, I forget the second half of your question. <laughs> is, the, is the white evangelical movement a growing movement or is it a declining movement? Okay, so when you look at demographic data, uh, white evangelicals are a shrinking proportion of the populace, and in particular, a shrinking proportion of 18 to 29 year olds, largely because 18 to 20, 29 year olds are less white and less religious than every other age demographic. Um, that said, what I talked about before with the anti-majoritarian structure of our democracy and the fact that they play such an outsized role in Republican Party politics 
and coupled with that, that they have spent decades building the political and religious infrastructure for this very robust political movement. You cannot look at it as just raw numbers of like how many, how many are there, is this a declining movement? There are still tens of millions of white evangelicals in this country. Many of them hold positions of power in politics or in the church or in religion or religious institutions, religious colleges, universities, think tanks, etc. And they have a very entrenched coalition with right-wing Catholics. And so this is the this is the base of one of our two political parties. So when people keep, you know, people keep bringing up, well, they're a decline, you know, they're in decline. Yes, they're in decline, but they were still in terms of raw numbers, even though they're 16% of the population, by the exit polling data, they were like 25 to 28% of the electorate. So they're very well organized. They're much more highly organized and disciplined in terms of politics and getting out to vote than almost any other demographic. And so you have to look at it through that lens. You cannot just look at the numbers and you always have to keep in mind that we still have a two party system. One of the two parties is in the thrall of this religious movement and beholden to it. And this religious movement has an outsized role in not only Republican party politics, but because of that in our politics as a whole. Okay, we have time for one more question in this session. However, Sarah has agreed to stay on a little bit later and I will be able to create a breakout room with her. And so after this question, I'm going to hand it back to Diana and we'll finish up and then I'll uh, see who wants to be part of that breakout room and I'll move you into that and you can continue to ask questions. So uh, the uh, next question is from, um, uh, Deborah, I'm not sure who that is, what the last name is. Okay, Deborah. Hi, yeah, um, I guess that was me. I Welcome. Was. Hi, thanks. Um, so this is actually just in response to the last question that was asked, or I guess the answer. Um, so you mentioned, I guess, like Trump's messengers, like Sidney Powell and Jenna Ellis. And um, I was just wondering, I mean, I guess maybe you don't know this, but your theories on this, if they actually believe what they're saying or if this is just part of the messaging. And if they do, I don't know, what do you think is more dangerous? Like if they are true believers or if they're opportunists? I guess that was the question. Yeah, I, I don't know um, whether they truly believe it. I mean, there, there was reporting um, last week that Jenna Ellis called Trump, you know, I can't remember what the, in 2016, she said he was a, I, I can't remember the exact phrase. The gist of it was that she said publicly that he was an ignorant idiot, you know, and now she's defending him. Um, you know, and Sidney Powell, you know, she's she's Mike Flynn's lawyer and she's propounded a lot of conspiracy theories in his, in his criminal case too. Um, I actually think it's probably more dangerous if they know that it's a conspiracy theory and it's not true. Um, because if they don't know that, I think it would be easier for the Republican Party as a whole to be just like, okay, goodbye. <laughs> but because they know that these are conspiracy theories that the base will latch onto and perpetuate, and the Republican Party is too afraid to alienate that base by calling out the conspiracy theories, I actually think that that's more dangerous than if um, Ellis and Powell were just rogue conspiracists that the Republican Party didn't care about. Thank you. Okay, uh, Diane Kazarski, if you're still on, I know you had, you had your hand up before. I don't see it. Okay, so what I'm going to do, as I say, is I will hand it back to Diana Gross to finish up. 